Okay, as you can see here, there's a radio, uh, mobile, and this is a CB radio, already partially disassembled. Uh, kind of hard to tell what it is, because as you can see, it has tape all around it. Um, it's a Ranger, or a T-Berry Ranger T model. Um, and the main reason I had this tape on there is this radio is in fairly good condition, and the higher-end T-Berries had the gold bezels, so and that stuff's fairly easy to damage, so just taped up to f protect the faceplate you know the bezel um uh this was sent in has uh no receive or transmit and uh, you know if somebody were to look at this and think oh fairly good work looking radio you know should be shouldn't be anything major to repair no transmit receive it's probably something simple you know it could be anything from you know switching relay to you know something in the oscillator circuit or something um, and it may be. I haven't even gotten to that point, and I'm not going to. And it's the main reason I'm doing this video is this one's more uh, to show why you should change these, and not just these. This one specifically, all of them. This is an electrolytic capacitor, and the reason you want to change all of them. You know, see all these little round cans down here, and they're all. Uh, let's take a look here real quick. Yeah, they're all the exact same color, and this is kind of a violet light violet to blue color so you know, all of them down in here they're all throughout the radio all the circuits are in this radio we're going to have them so they're spread you know even some of them down here embedded in the wax um they're all going to need to be replaced and this radio is a good example of why they should be replaced because this one had uh, a bad cap and it's not just bad it actually has leaked and it would be this one right here it's already been removed and to look at the bottom it's not swelled out but you know, there's there's no obvious damage, but it has leaked its dielectric or the electrolyte out of the bottom of it. And in most radios, that might not be a problem, because all of the circuit traces are down here on the bottom side. Well, on the bottom side, they're all protected by this green overcoat. Okay, except for, you, know, you can see back here, anywhere it wasn't protected by an overcoat, where they wanted heavy traces, they just, you know, they, they're but they're still protected by solder. So, you know, anything that didn't have odor coat on it has solder on it. So the, the traces on the bottom are fairly well protected. They at least have some, some level of protection there. On these early radios, and not just CBs, this goes for a lot of electronics in this vintage late 70s into the 80s. Your modern radios, both sides of the board will have that overcoat protecting them. But if you look down in here, you can see... There's circuit traces down in here. It's bare copper, okay? And therein lies the problem. When these things decide to belch, what comes out of them is corrosive to copper. And being a double-sided board, um, it leaked out onto copper traces on this side of the board. And, of course, nothing's ever easy for me. So, of course, the ones that leaked had to leak out in a difficult-to-get-to place right here. You could, you could see see them through this hole, but this is all mounted down in there, so both the transistor mounting screws were, you know, taken off there. It's easier just due to access instead of trying to get to the screws. It was just easier to unsolder the IC and transistor there, take out the three mounting screws along the top here, and just pull this entire plate out to gain access. And here's what happens when that capacitor leaked. You see that? See how that's corroded the circuit traces? Now luckily, and I've also removed a few other components. Here's another electrolytic that's been removed, and this one here has been removed. And that's just so I can gain access in here to clean this up. Okay, because you see, there's there's what that other small one was. That little flat pack one was right here, but I'm, I need to, but you can see how far out this corrosion has spread onto these traces. Now, fortunately, it doesn't look like it's really bad. It has corroded it, but it doesn't look to have corroded completely through it. You know, fortunately. Um, so, this is a good example of why you should change your electrolytic capacitors. They're all going to go bad eventually. They never, they don't last forever. They weren't designed to. They have a lifespan. Most, you know, most of your good capacitors, and I'm talking better than what they use in CB radios, especially the ones nowadays, your modern radios, they use about the cheapest things they can use. 
these were fairly good capacitors back then. Honestly, there weren't a lot of junk manu you know, junk component manufacturers around back in the 70s and 80s. Even your bottom bottom rung stuff is better than most of the stuff being used in a lot of today's cheap electronics. So, but they're going to go bad. I mean, even your ultra premiums. I mean, you get good quality. You're going to have high end audio stuff and like high end uh, stereo receivers. But you know, your ultra premium stuff is going to be mil spec, military specification stuff like you'd find in this, which it's it's a Sentinel, but it's just basically an HP. 510 um, multimeter, but it's vacuum tube operated, and even older still over here is an HP. Okay, another another piece of HP equipment. That's a 711A, which is a high voltage uh, power supply that goes up to 500 volts. And then I also have its big brother. It's not here on the bench on this bench. I have the the larger one, which is about two and a half times the size. It comes over to about here in width. Um, it and the main difference with that one is it does two times as much current as this one But the point being the capacitors in this and in this the electrolytics. They're still original and they're still good, but They're gig for starters. They're gigantic and they're literally hermetically sealed. They are There is just absolutely no comparison to the quality of something and like I say these aren't cheap but there's literally no comparison of, for capacitors used in consumer products and what they use in, in stuff like you know like that power supply and that power supply now you know, that power supply there has good that's not a cheap one that's a Wayne Kerr you know it's a modern switch mode power supply you know laboratory power supply you know but uh, you know several thousand dollar power supply but even it doesn't have capacitors in it as good a quality as what's in that that's from the 1940s and it still works perfectly, you know, other than when I got it needing some tubes and whatnot, um, it just needed to be calibrated and it's, it's perfect dead on. But the problem is that, you know, one capacitor, one of those can capacitors, let's say in that HP power supply over there would probably cost two to three times as much as this entire radio cost. So, you know, it's a price point. You use the best you can and keep it within a certain price range. So... They're all going to go bad. That's that's the key here, and that's why you should replace them. I always tell people it's you know, basically it's, and a lot of people call it the shotgun approach. So even if you have a radio that's working, if it's that old, you know this radio is from. You know, let's take a look at some date codes here. Looks like the late seventy-seven, early seventy-eight. Just going by the date codes on some of the ICs. Um, so it's late, you know, either late 1977, or early 1978 production. So, you know, there's, so let's just make the math easy. Say it was made in 1980. Well, there's 1980 to 1990 to 2000 to 2010. And we won't even count this year, just say to 2015. So there's 35 years. That's how, you know, this radio is old, actually older than that. Um, so, you know, it's definitely due for a cap change. I mean, I do it to my stuff, and not just radios, um, you know, like the uh, Solotron Schlumberger Stable Ock 4040 communication test set, which that's one hell of a mouthful, but every electrolytic capacitor in this has been replaced um, just for that reason. It did have some that were starting to go leaky. They had, you know, measured high ESD, or equivalent series resistance, and before they went bad, I changed them all. And you're talking, God, it took me close to probably a little over a week to change them all in this thing because that is a big huge piece of equipment it's it's got a lot of capacitors in it but uh i changed them to prevent stuff like that from happening um you know it's one thing goes bad in the cb radio but you've got a you know several thousand dollar piece of equipment you know those things ain't cheap um so you don't want it to go bad you know and, and do damage so but what you're going to do here, now like I say, luckily it doesn't look like that. I'm going to do a really quick cleanup here. But if the traces are actually bad to the point where they're corroded. So let's say this trace here, these smaller ones. Let's say from here to here it was just corroded so bad when you clean it off, it's gone. There's nothing left. Now a lot of people would just solder a wire from wherever the other lead ends to back over to here, call it a day and go on with it. That's not the proper way to do it. And especially in more modern radios, um, and CBs are now using surface mount technology as well. So CBs, ham radios, computers, everything nowadays is going to surface mount. They'll still have through-hole components for the larger stuff, but a lot of it's surface mount. 
Well, surface mount, you don't have the luxury of being able to just tack in pieces of wire to jumper traces together. Um, they need to be perfectly flat so the surface mount components can lay flat on the board and then be properly soldered in. So the proper way to do a repair, if this trace was, let's say, completely corroded away right here, the proper thing to do would be completely cut out the bad section and then you use copper foil. It's a lot of work, it's time consuming and very tedious work, but I buy sheets of copper, okay? So you literally have to trace out your old trace onto the copper foil and with a very small, you know, I use a scalpel, um, cut out a replacement trace and then, you know, epoxy that new trace down with, you know, it's designed for that. This is for electronics. Um, it has a very high temperature you know, epoxy down the new traces and solder them in, lap solder them in, you know, into the existing parts. But uh, like I said, let's see what we can do. And what I use, I've found the easiest. I know some people use sandpaper, use all kinds of stuff to do repairs like this. I have found, um, been using these things for years. My uncle and grandfather used these. They were in a uh, radio TV repair business. Now this is a brand name Rush Eraser. Um, is they're not cheap. You can buy cheaper ones from China, but they're basically just a fiberglass brush in a, you know, you unscrew the end there, fiberglass brush. Now these are, you know, now these are fairly fine bristles, so it's not very abrasive, but the ones in this one, which I almost need two hands to hold it and turn it, they're very stiff in there, okay? They're you can hear how stiff they are. But that's what I use to clean it up. So, you know, you get down in here. Clean as much the transistor out of the way. You're going to want to clean out as much of that corrosion as you can. And then neutralize, you know, to protect. Make sure there's, you know, no other oxidation down in there. So, you know... Trying to do this while holding the camera. Need four hands. Okay. And then get down in here. Some isopropyl. But you can see how that's cleaning up. We're back down to bare copper, which is what we want to see. We don't want to see any oxidation corrosion at all. You can see there's still some pitting down in this area. But I'll get that all cleaned up and neutralized and yeah I'll go ahead and pull these two wires out right here so I can get underneath and get all that cleaned out. But that's basically the process of what you're going to want to do is clean it until that's nice down to bare shiny copper. Make sure all that gunk is neutralized down in there so you don't have future problems and like I say if there had been if it had been like I say we got lucky here it's pitted but it's still good solid copper there so there's no need to cut any of this out but like I say the proper thing to do if that was damaged to the point where it was literally nothing left would be you know come back to a place where it's good cut it cut it here trace out on the copper foil a replacement piece to put in here and then you'll rough up the the surface of the fiberglass board and epoxy down a new trace and it'd be lap soldered in over here and over here to make the actual connection but uh yeah this is this is what happens when caps leak and you don't like i say you don't want that to happen especially in double-sided early boards like this so there's a perfect example of why to change all your caps so you know do it yourself pay someone to do it doesn't really matter who who does it but uh that's, that is the reason, because they're going to go bad. So, once I get this radio, get all the caps changed, um, like I say, that may actually fix, you know, leaking capacitors may actually be the problem why it's not receiving or transmitting. But if it's not, once I get it all back together, get that trouble shot and repaired um, and, you know, back working, I'll have, take this tape off so once the radio is all cleaned up and nice and shiny, um, do a quickie video because like I say these are very rare you don't see very many tea berry ranger teas so so everybody can see what this looks like um, I'll do a, another final video on this